Okay, folks, we are starting our tour of our solar system in what's hopefully a relatively familiar scene for an awful lot of you, our own Bay Area. The California Academy of Sciences, we really enjoy being from San Francisco Bay Area, and these days, a lot of us aren't seeing quite so much of it. We get a limited slice of the area right around our house and not a whole lot else. So looking around here, I wanted to give you a chance to see our Bay Area as we remember it, much bigger than our own homes. But we are going to be taking a tour of our solar system, looking at some of the really cool planets that go around our sun. So if any of you have questions or something you would love to see in our own solar system, put them up in our comments. We would be happy to take some suggestions about where we end up on our tour today. But to start things off, we are doing a relatively close to home tour, looking above ourselves right now. And as we zoom back, you might notice in just a few seconds, it's going to get a lot harder to see the Bay Area. Not just because we're getting farther and farther away, but because today is a pretty cloudy day. This imagery you're seeing right now is not something that was taken months and months ago from a NASA satellite. This was taken, in fact, just yesterday from our Suomi spacecraft orbiting around planet Earth. It's a partnership between NASA and the uh, NOAA administration. But working together, they have an awesome spacecraft that can show us Earth in incredible detail. Now, because this is a real, actual satellite photograph, we get to see some kind of funny stuff. If you look around on Earth, you might notice a couple bright white stripes, almost like tiger stripes crisscrossing. Those aren't actually there. Or rather, they are actually there, but what we're seeing is sunlight bouncing off the surface of Earth. As our spacecraft goes around planet Earth, taking a photo of the entire planet takes a good long time. So because the sun passes overhead and Earth is always spinning, we actually get to catch sunlight bouncing straight off the water several times per day. In fact, as you went around, I bet you'd get almost 24 of those individual ticks. Now we're going to move back just a bit more. And as we do, we're going to see Earth kind of recede off into the distance. As Earth disappears, you might notice we are not quite alone. There is, in fact, another object hanging out next to us in space. That is our moon. Now, I would love to take us over to our moon. Our moon has some really cool stuff we can see on the surface. So let's head there now. As we head off to our moon, you're actually going to notice the moon from our angle is only a faint crescent. Has anyone seen the moon recently? Turns out we are looking at a crescent moon. In this software, we call it open space. You should be able to see that on your computer. You can see some really cool stuff. Looking at open space, this is an accurate representation of our solar system at the present moment. As things change in the solar system around us, this software changes too. So we see the moon in the correct phase. We see darkness falling on the right part of the moon, and you can see the same stuff at home. If you want to check it out, look at the openspaceproject.com. Now, when you look at the moon's surface, you might notice it doesn't look quite like Earth. First of all, no Bay Area for us to find. But perhaps most importantly, looking around here, we can see a lot of variation on the surface. There's light stuff. There's dark stuff. The light stuff is what we call the highlands. The dark stuff is the mare, or the cratery regions with a lot of dark lava material accumulating inside. Let's dive in and see some of this stuff a little closer up. Now, when I say a little closer up, I mean a lot closer. Way down here, you might be able to pick out individual craters. And some of these craters look pretty cool. Poking around here on the surface, this is very flat, you might notice. This whole area has only a few craters on it. And that's because it was a lava bed at one point. Lava flowing across the surface of the moon has a very low consistency. Imagine pouring oatmeal out of your bowl. It's very chunky, very thick. That would be like some of the lava we have here on Earth. That's very thick, chewy, kind of tough stuff. On the moon, it's going to be a lot thinner, maybe a little bit more like soup, or as one of our favorite scientists, Dr. Day, says, like cold olive oil. So it's going to flow around and cover things up. Now, when you're looking at the surface like this, you get to see some of those tall peaks just disappear underneath that lava. That's probably where lava flowed up the side, so that only the top of a mountain is still sticking out. As we zoom back, you can start to see that we were looking inside a very round feature. That round feature right over here, we think was probably a giant crater at one point too. 
the moon has evidence of some very large impacts on the surface. And to see all of them, we're going to utilize a little bit of planetarium magic and let us see the entire surface of the moon by taking away nighttime on the moon's surface. There we go. Now, this is more like what we would see maybe on a full moon, because this is the side of the moon that faces Earth. Around here, those giant impact sites become obvious, and you can see something really cool on them, the ejecta. Now, to spot that ejecta, I'm going to slow down our rotation and take us into a specific region right over here. Now, when you look at the ejecta, it's stuff from inside the moon's surface that has been flung up onto the outside. A crater happens when something big from space slams into the surface of a rocky object. And as this thing hit, you can see all that dusty material coming off the sides, shooting out in every direction from that single impact. So if I were a scientist who wanted to know what was going on inside the moon, I could send a spacecraft down to land somewhere on the surface and drill down in. Or I could just land on this ejecta and analyze that stuff that's been on the surface waiting for me. Now, it's a lot easier for us to land on the ejecta. In fact, that's where some of our lunar missions were headed to learn about the ancient history of the moon itself. And before we fly away, there's one of my personal favorite features, the gamma, the Reinhardt gamma right over here is this weird squiggly interplay of light and dark. Often when we look at the moon's surface, a different in composition, maybe more iron rich or less iron rich, Maybe a taller surface or a shorter surface could give us some color variation. But this is a totally flat area, and it still has that weird change. Some evidence suggests that part of the moon's surface could be protected by some sort of magnetic field there. But that's still an open question and one that scientists are eager to find out more about. Now, we've spent a lot of time already, and we've only talked about the stuff that's in our own backyard. So let's take a trip out into our broader solar system and see some of the other cool things that are traveling around. Some folks are asking about why we have one moon when other planets have so many. Our moon probably formed alongside Earth, which gives us a kind of shared past. When we talk about other planets, they either have more moons than us or less moons than us. I can't think of too many others that only have one. So we're kind of special. One planet that has more moons than us is Mars. When we talk about Mars, it actually has two moons going around it. We have Phobos and Deimos. Now, those two orbits are pretty close to Mars's surface. They travel around Mars very quickly in a number of hours. If you want to see a lot of moons, though, we have to head to our outer planets. They have dozens and dozens of moons in the case of Jupiter and Saturn, or at least a couple, just over a dozen in the case of Uranus and Neptune. When we get to our really big planets like Jupiter, Jupiter's so big its surface is still tiling in. I promise Jupiter isn't actually a giant gray blob. But let's go look at some of those lunar orbits traveling around Jupiter. Now, in order to see them, we can bring up the four big ones right here. Those four are our Galilean moons. There's Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. These are all large objects, at least the size of our moon or bigger. When we talk about smaller objects, the minor moons of Jupiter, well, there's a whole bunch of them. We used to tell people that Jupiter had the most moons in our solar system, but alas, these days, that's not the case. When we're talking about moons in the Jupiter system, we have, I think it was around 72 was our last count, but these days we actually have even more around Saturn. So things are moving in Saturn's direction for having that solar system superlative. So let's head out towards Saturn. We should be able to see some cool features there too. Heading out towards Saturn, we get to see that first most distinguishing feature, of course, the ring. Now the ring of Saturn is beautiful to look at, absolutely amazing. And the really cool thing is you can see it from here on Earth if you have a medium-sized telescope, let's say four inches or a little bigger. But looking at Saturn's rings three-dimensionally, we can actually see where the shadow of Saturn falls on those rings, almost like someone took a giant bite out of the surface. You can also see where the shadow of the rings falls on Saturn in this software, which is a super cool look. Now, right down there, you can see that shadow of the rings. Saturn's surface doesn't get a lot of credit most of the time. People talk about the clouds of Jupiter, and people sometimes think of Saturn as boring, but that's not fair. Saturn has a really amazing surface. We're just learning about it a little later than we learned about Jupiter. 
One of the coolest features on Saturn, and something that's another surface mystery here, is this hexagon right on the surface. If you're pretty good at ge geometry, you've probably already recognized it, but there's a six-sided shape right here, and that shape becomes obvious when you're looking at the pole of Saturn. We're not exactly sure what's causing that giant hexagon storm. It's a pretty interesting thing to be sure. Okay, so once again, looking back towards our comments, see if anybody has a suggestion of a next planet to go visit. We got a lot of cool planets in our solar system, and we've only touched on a couple. If it's one I've already mentioned and you want to dive back in, just let me know, and we are happy to go return and explore one of your favorite worlds. Well, I've got an idea for another really cool place to check out, and since I'm flying, it's going to be hard for you folks to stop me. Let's see. We are going to head towards the inner part of the solar system and go visit an often ignored planet, Mercury. Now, when we dive in towards Mercury, we've got pretty good photos of Mercury, which is a challenge to do because Mercury is relatively close to the sun. It's not a fun environment to operate a spacecraft in. Even though solar energy is abundant, you need a pretty rugged spacecraft to survive the inner solar system. But when we look at the imagery. I think a lot of it's taken from our messenger mission, if I'm recalling correctly. We get to see some cool stuff on the surface. At first glance, it looks a little bit like the moon. And I think you'd be forgiven if you confuse the two images without context. But when we're looking at Mercury up close, you might notice something is missing. On the moon's surface, we got to see a lot of that dark mare material. And when we're looking here, you just don't notice it. Now, Mercury does have a lot of iron in it. In fact, Mercury has a lot of iron in it down in its core, but we don't see as much of that iron-rich lava pooling around on the surface. Much the shame. Mare is a cool feature to check out, but because of that, we can see Mercury's history written out on the surface. A cool thing you can do on Mercury is look at these craters. Now, if you were a lunar, or I should say, planetary scientist, and you were looking at this crater up close, let's say we've got big crater and little crater. Which one would you say happened first, the big crater or the little crater? It can be kind of hard to guess when you're just looking at rocks, but I would say that the big crater had to be there before the little crater because the little crater's on top of the big crater. And if you use that same simple idea and look around the surface of Mercury, you can start to understand the history of those objects. Now, Ryan Wyatt, our director, is asking, is there another mission heading to Mercury? I would have to go check that out. I know there's a lot of upcoming NASA missions, and I would be remiss if I stated confidently which one was coming up. But we also have Amanda asking to go check out Venus. And I will say Venus is an awesome planet, to be sure, perhaps one of the most interesting in our solar system. But I feel like I say that about every planet, because every planet in our solar system is super interesting. Now, as we head to Venus... You might notice Venus looks a little different in our software than many of the usual depictions we see. It's because when we look to Venus, we usually can't see the surface. The clouds are just too thick. You can see a little bit of surface wrapped around Venus in our software. That's uh, that kind of yellowy haze you see. But we are looking at a radar image, basically a map of the surface used by casting radio waves down and seeing what bounces back up. Now on this map, there's a bunch of cool things to see including these massive fissures. There are craters, but not as many as Mercury. I would guess that it's possible the atmosphere protects the surface from some of those impacts. And potentially the surface of Venus is still a little bit active. When you see big round things though, don't immediately assume it's a crater. Many of them we think are volcanoes, potentially something like a pancake volcano. Now on Earth, we like to name things volcanoes after the shape they take. So if it was a cone volcano, that might be shaped like an ice cream cone. If it was a shield volcano, that might be shaped like a round Viking shield. When you look at these volcanoes, pancake volcanoes, they are in fact shaped like pancakes. They're just very wide and flat. Okay, so the atmosphere of Venus actually has something in common with our own atmosphere. It's got carbon dioxide in it. I should say carbon. Now, on our planet, most of our atmosphere is nitrogen. On Venus's atmosphere, I believe most of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, and that gets pretty rough. So 
if you've got a very thick atmosphere made of very heavy stuff, you can trap a lot of heat on the surface. Light passes through, but infrared does not escape. It gets trapped on the surface and gets hotter and hotter and hotter, what we like to call the greenhouse effect. Now, we've seen a little bit of that same kind of effect here on planet Earth, and it's made people a little concerned about putting too much energy into Earth's atmosphere and making Earth's atmosphere a little too hot. When I talk about visiting Venus, that sounds pretty unfun. I like to think of Venus as the worst vacation spot in the solar system. The surface is 900 degrees, the air is acidic, and you would be squashed flat by the pressure. Okay, so we got some requests for some asteroid belt objects. Let's go out and find some. Way out here, if we're looking for the asteroid belt, we actually have to go pretty far back. It resides between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So zooming back more and more and more, I can show you right over here, one of the objects that's hanging out in the asteroid belt. This is Ceres. Now, Ceres used to be a planet. In fact, some of you might remember when Ceres was a planet. It was only 200 and something years ago, if you take really good care of yourself, I guess. But looking at Ceres, we can imagine it when it was discovered as being a really exciting thing. No one had found a planet since, well, Uranus. Now, our software is struggling a little bit with our map of Ceres, but I will say this actually doesn't look too far from what Ceres normally looks like. It is gray, it is a ball but we would expect a lot more craters on the surface and some very interesting features, some deposits, what we think might be Epsom salts or something like it on the surface of Ceres. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what's going on inside Ceres. Some people think it's going to have a water-rich outer surface. Others disagree completely. But in either case, learning about the interior of objects like this could be really cool. Why? Are we planning a mission for humans to go live on Ceres? Probably not. Maybe never. Ceres would be a tough place for humans to survive. There's no atmosphere. It's got very low gravity. But this is exciting because we think of the asteroid belt and an even farther out belt called the Kuiper belt as places that could teach us about the beginning of our solar system, where stuff comes from, and how our solar system came to be. So we've got a request for Io. I'm wondering if we have Io in our software. If we don't, it's going to look an awful lot like we just saw, and that's not that exciting. But we can take a swing by and double check. Now Io, I can see why people want to check it out, is one of the four Galilean moons. It's a big moon, and it has more volcanoes than anything else in the solar system. In fact, we can see the surface in excruciating detail right up here. Now, I've heard people say Io kind of looks like a cheese pizza. I agree. It is covered with these weird light deposits, dark spots, and kind of a yellowy in-between color, kind of looks like cheddar cheese. This would not be a fun moon to eat, though. What we're seeing are sulfur on the surface. All that volcanic activity is depositing a ton of material. But there is something kind of cool that links Io and Earth. They're the only two objects I know of that have lights on their nighttime side. I suppose maybe a lightning storm on Jupiter or Venus might cause a brief flash. But when we look at the nighttime side of Io, sometimes we can actually catch a volcano there. When you look at the nighttime side of Earth, you can see human cities, our civilization, glowing out into the night. That's pretty cool. Now, Io is also a very volcanically active spot, as I responded, and Earth is pretty volcanically active too. We have seen other volcanoes even in this part of the solar system erupting off the surface of Europa and Enceladus around Saturn, we have seen cryovolcanoes. And that's shooting watery material from an ice volcano out into space. Oh, Titan. So Titan, I got to say, is my favorite moon. This is a tour of some of my favorite objects. I promise for those of you watching, these are not all plants I've sent out there. Titan, I got to say, is the tops. Now, Titan is the second largest moon in our solar system. Ganymede around Jupiter is the actual largest. But Titan, when we first discovered was unusual, is when we discovered it had an atmosphere wrapped around it. And not just any atmosphere, a nitrogen atmosphere. But if you peeled that nitrogen atmosphere back, this is what the surface might look like. It'd probably look a little bit more yellow because light's passing through that orangey haze. But when you look at the surface itself, you can see, again, this light stuff and dark stuff. 
Light stuff we think might be slightly higher, lifted up regions, the dark stuff slightly lower. It's possible though that the dark stuff is a mixture of liquids and sand dunes. Now on the surface of Titan, I believe there's something like uh, hydrocarbons floating around on the surface, something we might think of as like rocket fuel here on Earth. It's cold enough on Titan for that to just pool on the ground. But because it has liquid that evaporates and then rains back down, you could say it's got a fluid cycle, if not a water cycle. Water would not do a water cycle on the surface of Titan. It would be frozen solid. In fact, a lot of what we think of as rock on the surface isn't made of the same elements as rock here on Earth. It's actually water. But on the surface of Titan, it is so cold that the water starts to act like bedrock and stuff flows around it, flows through it, and carves features in it, like rivers, valleys, lakes, and streams. So moving back from Titan, let's see if there's any last targets. Underrated parts of our solar system? Oh man, there are so many. The empty spots between planets gets no cred at all, but we are still discovering some pretty interesting stuff. And now we can also talk about some weird stuff that's winging through our solar system, like Oumuamua, that was an object from another star that happened to fly past. And potentially, we're going to be finding a lot more similar objects. We are coming up not too long on our time window, though. In fact, we may have jumped past a little bit of it. If any of you have more questions, we would love to hear them from Morrison Planetarium. My name is Josh once again, but we are going to be doing a Thursday broadcast with our assistant director, Bing Kwok. And if you have astronomy questions you'd like answers to, he is an incredible resource. I might be tuning in as well just to give us a little bit of space uh, beyond our night sky. But if you folks have questions, put them in the comments and we will do our very best to follow up on Thursday. Tune in at 1.30. Thank you all for joining us here for our broadcast. Stay happy, stay healthy, and remember, there's always more space out there for us to keep observing. Thanks again. <laughs>